Thank you very much, and thank you very much to everybody for sharing your stories. Yes, I am a stand-up comedian. Uh, they say you are who you are in kindergarten, and I flunked. So <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, my birthday, Halloween, another strike. Uh, but I did make pants legal in Seattle public schools. I had these little brown legs, no tights, crappy boots, and uh, I started a little petition in fifth grade and we got 100 signatures and pants were legal the next year. So pretty proud of that, still talking about it at 55. Uh, but yeah, try, try, trying to make a difference. So um, also make commercials with Ron, you know, trying to make a living as a comic, no insurance, but having fun, being on Laugh Across Las Vegas, performed with the Latin Kings of Comedy, performed with the Queen Mary, touched Hugh Hefner's arm, I don't know why. Um, it was there, along with Marilyn Monroe's pretty dresses, it's just, just to prove I was that close. Um, it, it was, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I did not start comedy until my husband left me. A couple of them, actually, if we're honest. Uh, but the last one left me eight days before Christmas, and so I started watching some of the comedians, and they weren't that funny. So I thought, hey, I can do that. Look at your chin. Um, I was uh, cast as the witch in The Wizard of Oz. Only I would be proud of that moment. Uh, it was fun, but they were trying to give me a fake dog, and can you pretend to pedal? No, I need a bike, I need a dog. You know, you don't have to pay me, but these are a couple of things I need. Uh, then uh, what happened was I used to always make this joke about how I would gain weight and I'd get it in my face. I'd never have a rear, but I'd get a goiter. And that was just kind of one of my standard jokes. You know, I, I really don't know why I said it as much as I did. I figured that's why God did this or the karma, you know, uh, words do have such power. So one day I kind of felt like things weren't right and I told my caveman boyfriend, my caretaker who's not here obviously, I told him that um, if he didn't take me to the hospital right away, I wouldn't be able to see my kids. And for once he listened and he took me and um, went to Renton and they did the little check and they did a scan and they said you have no white blood cells so you need to go to Swedish. And I already had RA. Uh, I knew I was probably going to get that because all my aunts had it. I call myself the closet cripple, not necessarily on stage normally. My, it was kind of my goal to be more famous at the casinos, but it turns out hospitals are where I'm meant to be. Um, so I got arthritis on my 40th birthday, and I learned from that, don't go on your birthday to the hospital, just, or the doctors, really, because then you can't get diagnosed with anything on your birthday. So the arthritis was pretty much a big struggle. You're in pain 24 hours a day. It affects your bones, your muscles, and your tissues. Um, you're talking about feet, oh my God, there's so many nerve endings in your feet. And then I was at Nordstrom's 10 years, you, those cute shoes are out of the question. The slippers, slippers is the way I roll normally, um, which can ruin an outfit. But so dealing with your arthritis, and again, trying to hide it, you know, I was the embryo poster child. Um, they lied and they said I was a baker. Everybody knows I'm doggy bag girl. I am not the baker. I am not the cook. Uh, so um, they, we had the shots, the emerald shots, and you had to learn to give them yourself. And I felt sorry for myself a lot, you know, around everybody, thinking I'm the only one in pain, and I'm the only one who has to do shots, and shots should be tequila, and I don't like any of this. So dealt with the arthritis, and you know they'd always say, "How you doing? How you doing?" Well, it never gets better, so I'm not doing well. And you, but you know you don't want to be like telling everybody, "Hey, I hurt everywhere. You want to talk about it? How about you? Where do you hurt?" You know. So anyway, still performing, plugging along, doing my thing, and then um, I went to Swedish Hospital and didn't know what they were going to do, what was going to happen. I knew that I'd had some family members that had breast problems, but um, I figured mine were small, I'll be okay. Didn't really know what was going to happen, and then all of a sudden life took a different turn and they started saying leukemia and they started saying you know crazy things and just started somehow I, my body wasn't even my body anymore it was all about needles and you know it was just like and these hundred thousand dollar scans and I and when I called up the hospital and I called up Dr. Rifkin and the nurse said if you don't have insurance turn your car around and I tell you, I've never cried so hard in my life. And the doctor picked up the phone, said, come on in. That doctor saved my life. And that's Dr. Saul Rivkin. He has his own wing at Swedish. I have his home cell number. Love the man. 
love the man, 200 days in that hospital, you get very attached. He might not want me to be his family, <laughs> I'm his family. Uh, and so we went through this process and uh, I did spend 200 plus days, lost track, lost track of everything. It was, it was almost two years and the collectors were calling me from the bed. And let me tell you, I wasn't too comic-like on those phone calls. And then when you're having to deal with, you know, all these tests and all these crazy things, you keep on thinking, all right, well, this can't get any worse. This just can't get any worse. This happened in July of 2012. So then they're still, they're, they're doing these bone marrow tests. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not gonna like that very much at all. You're gonna put me to sleep, right? You know, oh no, they don't put you to sleep. And I don't know if you've ever seen that video where the horse kicks the guy about 12 feet for branding him. Well, I would have done that to the doctor if I could have reached him. That came out clean. And I said, next time you give me one of those, you're gonna give me a baby, <laughs> period. And my daughter said, mom, you don't need any babies. Give me the baby for a few minutes, I'll give it back. <laughs> but you're not going at me with that razor blade again. Okay, well this time we're going to keep you comfortable. Really? Okay, am I going to be sleeping? You're going to keep me that comfortable? We're going to keep you comfortable, we promise. Then they had me face down again, did the same, dark. I was tricked, no baby. That was it. But the good news, no leukemia, okay? Things are going all right, but it's like, why am I still here? and what's going on. So finally they said, all right, well, now we figured out you don't have leukemia, you don't, so I'm supposed to be grateful, you know, really, really, really happy, you just got all right, everything's fine, you got, I think I was about 300,000 at that point. And then they said, okay, well now we've decided that um, we're gonna take your neck and we're gonna start here and we're gonna cut a five inch scar straight across. And I remember looking back at my boyfriend thinking, he's not gonna like this, he wants me to shut up, but this could be a deal breaker. You know, and it might not help my career either. You know, I mean, turtlenecks are great, but when scarves are good, I look like snowman with scarves. So, but you know, you're not gonna say, well, hey, my vanity says keep the cancer. No, and you don't want, and, and like Dancing with the Stars, she's pretty proud, you know, and she's survived it and that's just great. But how come her scars are only an inch? How come mine's five? Can't you go in the back way? And you, you don't wanna do that because it's your life. So finally I got over myself and said, okay, of course I had no choice. And they cut me open the first time. All right, no cancer, perfect. But I'm still in this bed, and I had something called Feltis. And if you Google it, everybody who has it is dead, and it happens to men. And what it is is you can't hold any white cells. So at one point, I had seven. And at that time, I was in the hospital, of course, and you can't buy white cells. You can buy red, but you can't buy white. So I was just, come on, white cells, come on, white cells. And I remember being in the hospital, and uh, my only friend was my cell phone, and they were actually sending in the preacher who was making dirty jokes. I'm like, wow, was that a priest that just made a dirty joke? Okay. And then they'd have other nationalities or uh, church Religion. people, yes, not nationalities, church people, coming in and giving me my last rites, and um, I was supposed to be preparing my will, and that, and I'm 55. All I could keep on thinking is this is not my time yet. I, I got some things I gotta do. My joke used to be that I was going to make bars legal in retirement homes. Okay, well, I've quit that joke, you know, but, you know, I, I still want to make a difference. Um, I didn't know I was going to make this kind of difference. Uh, people think that once you have cancer, somehow you're contagious. I, I still haven't figured that one out, and I don't know if it's because they look at us and they think, I might get it too, I need to get a test, or, you know, they're afraid that we're going to whine about our particular situation. I think we have a right to. Um, I did a lot of coloring in there. I learned to do spirograph. Uh, it, was, it was quite the ordeal. Well, they ended up cutting the neck again. Well, at that point, you already got a scar, so whatever, just go for it and get it all. But they're saying, hey, you might not be able to talk. You might not be able to, all these scary things. And it's just like, you know, what are you supposed to do with that information? I talk for a living. That's all I do. I'm not known for cleaning. I don't cook. I don't sew. I can't skip. I mean, please don't take my voice. You know, I'm not that good a writer. I mean, you know, I mean, I can write my own stuff, but don't take my voice. Cut me open the second time. Bam, stage three. All right, now it's getting worse. It's ramping up now. All right, RA, stage three, ramping up, ramping up. 
And I just had to look up. And I'm calling Ron, crying, 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 calling. And anybody who answers the phone, who's answering that phone at 3 in the morning? You know, God stopped talking to me now. Who am I going to call? And I had to look up and I had to say, all right, this isn't my life. Just pull myself out of my body. It's not my life. It's not. I'm in a movie. I've been cast a very, very bad part, and I'm not getting paid. And that's the only way I got through it. Besides those nurses that are so wonderful. You don't really understand. I wanted to be a nurse until somebody threw up, and I was eight, and I said, uh -uh, not me. I'm not going to be a nurse anymore. Um, but I, I just, nurses, oh my goodness, and caretakers too. You know, for those of you that have st stuck by and, and, and really given that emotional support, um, it's such a gift. It's such a gift that you're giving that other person. And I can tell you that from somebody who went through it alone. Yeah, he was in the bed, you know, next to me. And he visited me, but, you know, he's shopping at Westlake when I'm on the feeding tube. So it wasn't the kind of caregiving stuff I wanted. You kind of find out who cares about you through this, you know. And you really find out what's important, too. You know, I mean, looks used to be so important to me. And now it's like life is, you know, and, and this new life, this new life with this fuzzy hair, you know, um, and then, you know, it just kind of keeps getting worse. Then they, just, they come in and they say, well, now we're going to nuke you. What do you mean you're going to nuke me? And they hand you this crazy medicine and, you know, it brought your teeth and, um, you know, they, they put paper on everything. Even the nurses were throwing the food at you and they had this metal barrier that they're hiding behind. I'm thinking, I'm swallowing the stuff you're hiding behind? Great. This is making me feel better. Then they come in and they say, well, you, we believe, have a turnimus ilius. And I'm thinking, and I was an ex court reporter. I'm thinking, terminus. Okay, that sounds like terminal. Don't like that word. And intimus. That sounds like the end of something. I don't want a tournament at my end is at all. No. No. I think you're in the wrong room. I think I have enough problems to deal with. You know, really, I, I, I'm having a hard time already. Dying. And they said, okay, well, it's either going to go away by itself or we're going to have to operate. Well, thank God that one went away by itself. Otherwise, I'd be whining about that. Um, so they did cut me back open and said I had stage three. And my joke about that, which isn't real original, is there's no stages in cancer. And if there is, I want the first stage. Don't sign me up on three. You know, I mean, if I was this lucky in other things, I would have won the lottery. Although I did win Dr. Rivkin, so I'll still, and Swedish. You know, I, I think it's so important with what this room has that we go to the very, very best. Um, I don't think that we can go to the country bumpkin on any of the stuff or be anybody's experiment. And it's great for me to hear so many survivors in this room that have gone so many years. And I think to myself, is there a day that goes by that you don't think about it? I didn't think so. I was just hoping you were going to say, yes, there is. After five, it's gone. Shoo. No, it's hard. And, and I, like I was telling Kyle, I become a fanatic at looking at people's necks. You know, not down, at their necks. I mean, you look at their eyes and their necks, and their necks and their eyes. I mean, I don't, even on TV, I'm going to call the people that have problems. You know, suddenly, I think I can diagnose people. It's, it's you know, it's, 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 yeah, you start to have like a neck fetish. And this did not run in my family, so I couldn't um, blame that. I really think it's my bad jokes that did it. I think it's that, you know, I said things that, you know, zip was, I had somebody in Yelm when I was at the butcher last week say that it was because I wasn't quiet. I got cancer because I wasn't quiet and because I wasn't peaceful. And I thought, boy, you're from Yom, aren't you? You're right, I'm not quiet and peaceful. I'm not going to be quiet to you. And then she told me I needed to bless my food. Well, I didn't kill it, and I'm not going to bless it because you'll make me mad. And then I ran into her at the casino a few hours later, and I thought, I still don't like you. You know, I remember that woman forever. How dare she? I'm not going to talk about you on stage, woman from Yelm. No, I don't, I think, uh, I don't know why it's here. I, I guess it's um, so that we realize how precious life is and how we realize how small things are precious. I know with thyroid, you can't eat a darn thing. Not a darn thing. How am I supposed to live on grapes and water mountain and gain weight? How is that working for me, you know? I had a talking bird. You can see her on my Twitter. Uh, Ron and I make commercials. Linda, the comic TV lady because I change last names so often. Diaz I bought for 75. 
Uh, and I was not thinking. I should have bought an Italian one. What the heck was I thinking? I had this pointy chin then, and then Brenda's don't change that. So I'm stuck now with this Mexican name. That was before Border Wars. But, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know. So I want to say Linda Diaz. -a. I don't know. I, I, and for 75, you can't change it. But the problem is, is then you have to carry this package of papers with you of all your names. And then you're like Elizabeth Taylor without the Taylor, well, although I was a Taylor. Um, I used to perform as a Jones, and they started calling me Smith on stage, and it really annoyed me, and that's why I bought Diaz, because I wasn't going to mess up the Bradley name. So yes, I'm a Bradley Diaz. Um, don't speak Spanish worth a darn, but I know if you're talking about me. So um, yeah, and then when I was performing on stage, they say, oh, you look like Celine or Celine Dion on crack, and you know, they say all those nice things. Yeah, I know that was real nice, wasn't it? Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really something else. And so I'm, I'm just now starting to get back into being in front of a camera again. Because it was kind of like, for a while, it was like, camera wasn't my friend. You know, it's, uh, it, it's hard. It's really, really hard. And, and I think it's really hard to be part of this special group. You know, I, I don't want to talk to anybody healthy, really. I, um, those conversations, unless they're seven. I mean, if they're young, I can take it. But, it, you know, I really, I really do want to speak to people who are battling. Um, because at 3 o'clock in the morning, who do we talk to? You know, apparently now I have a number. Um, <laughs> you know, besides the consulting nurse, where do they send you to Texas? I'm uh, scared, and then you go back to Google, and then you go to Inspire website, and it doesn't inspire you, it depresses you. And, you know, it's, um, it's something. And then um, I'm not supposed to talk about this, but I'm going to. My daughter, when she was visiting me all this time, it's 200 days, she ignored a cyst. And it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And I nagged her and I nagged her and I nagged her and I nagged her. And it didn't work. Finally, it was to the point where I told her, I said, Ashley, even though I haven't drank since my diagnosis, I'm going to drag you by your hair. And I'm going to make such a scene, you're going to be sorry. Because I'm going to embarrass you for everybody. I'm going to do it your job. She went in. And she had to have her breast removed at 27. It was an 11.2 cyst. So then I kind of stopped being such a crybaby because it was my baby in the bed that time and I wanted to grab her by her foot and jump in. Now, now you're messing with my baby, you know? So I thought, all right, again, can't get any worse. They don't make this stuff up. And I got a text from my 32-year-old son. He broke his penis in half. I thought, they're joking. This is a joking text. Somebody's messing with me. They weren't. So I ran and drove like a crazy person, screaming, get out of the way! Worse in terms of endearment, just crazy. Got to Harborview. He had an eight-hour surgery. They fixed it. Apparently, it was his third date with someone. And people always, how did it happen? Well, like, I'm going to ask him that. <laughs> I don't know, circus acts. I don't know what they did. They sat wrong. I don't know. This is a little bit, first the breast, don't talk about that. Now how can I not talk about the broken penis? My goodness, God sends you some challenges. You know, and he went in the ambulance a few times, and he only visited me twice, so I figured that's what God did to him. You know, so I think he's got a little bit more empathy now, understanding, you know, it's, and it's hard for kids. They, they don't really, hey, I want to talk about cancer, but Mom, it's my birthday. I'm sorry, I'm having a bad day, you know. When is it a good day for me to call you up and talk about cancer? Let's circle that day, and I'm going to freaking keep you on it all day, because I'm going to work that day. You know, so, um, wow. You know, it's, uh, and I think sometimes your body kind of tells you something was wrong, but you don't really know. And, and like I say, it's like now, I, you know, you look at your shoulders, and you look at your neck, and, and then you're constantly worried about it spreading. And so, you know, I think a group like this can really give a newbie like me, you know, I mean, I really look forward to the day when I can say I'm a survivor. I can so far say I survived, but, and, and you know, I, I met a gentleman, he had Parkinson's, and I was feeling pretty sorry for myself until I saw him with Parkinson's, and that about brought tears to my eyes, and he was just a sweet old guy, and of course, I'm still trying to sell him a commercial, if you want to show and he said, uh, you know, this is, this is my last page. And I turned to him and I said, no. I said, it might be your last chapter, but who knows how long a chapter is? And so my joke about that is the beginning of your book can be bad, like flunking, sorry, kindergarten. 
and you know you can go through your struggles but you want the end of your book to be good so I guess that's why I probably had this happen to me so that I can quit being the closet rheumatoid arthritis girl so that I can actually tell people that you know even Kathleen Turner was afraid I won't get any parts I mean that's crazy that we have to keep these things a secret I mean these things are affecting us so much um, medically financially I figure I'm gonna be working from the coffin I did qualify for charity care which I'm very grateful for um, but they still left me a pretty big piece you know but at least I n am now doing what I love and I would love to be on Kyle's list to have people call me because a lot of times I'm in bed or I keep you know crazy hours so I would like to be part of that lifeline to possibly be able to inspire them to you know share with them because because really my battle has been quite small compared to a lot of you in the room and I want you to know how much that's touched my heart and you can certainly find me on Twitter, Comic Linda TV Lady. You can find me on LinkedIn. If you want to see any personal pictures, those are on Twitter. Facebook, not so much. Look at the face. Don't want to be showing that. Um, like in my day, MySpace, right? It meant give me my space. Um, Life swap meant they really swapped. I mean, things have, all, things have all changed. But you can find me pretty good, Linda Diaz. And thank you very much for your time. I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you.